Hello, uh, this is Paul Giamatti speaking. This is Stephen Asma, <laughs> late co-host. Yeah, there you are. Also, also speaking, you're late. You just got in. <laughs> you just arrived. Uh, here we are. This is um, we as promised. This is a continuation. This is a bonus wag, uh, an addendum with uh, theoretical physicist, astrophysicist, cosmologist, Frank B. Baird, Jr., professor of science at Harvard University, author of the books Extraterrestrial and Interstellar, Dr. Avi Loeb, from our amazing conversation with him previously. Correct, Steve? Yeah, this guy is really worth your time. And uh, he's also one of the few people that can explain dense astrophysics in a way that involves like marriage counseling and (laughs) dating and all kinds of great metaphors. Very, very basic ways of thinking about things that are really helpful. (laughs) Yeah. So here we go. I was interviewed on on, uh, radio and uh, about... um, a, a meteor that landed uh, near Kamchatka uh, in December um, uh, 2018. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so on January, I was asked about it and I checked online uh, and I found a catalog of meteors that uh, NASA compiled based on data that came from U.S. government satellites. Every now and then they see an object colliding with Earth and generating a fireball. These are meteors. Mm. And they decide, well, this is not uh, of any national security interest, we can give it to the scientists. So that's then they deliver the data to NASA and NASA makes a catalog. So then I, I told my student, let's check whether any of these meteors cataloged by NASA is moving too fast to be bound to the sun. We checked and we found one that was definitely not bound. In fact, outside the solar system, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second, a thousand times faster than the speed limit in the highway. And moreover, it exploded in the lower atmosphere and had a material strength that was tougher than all other meteors cataloged by NASA, 272 of them. So I said, well, you know, maybe it's a Voyager-like meteor. Uh-huh. And so uh, my colleagues, when we submitted the paper for publication, now, you know, said, uh, we don't believe the U.S. government. Ah. And so I reached out. Uh, I was, at the time, I chaired the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies. And eventually we got a letter from the U.S. Space Command. After three years, the U.S. Space Command issued a letter saying they looked back at the data and they can confirm at the 99.999% that indeed this object, this meteor, came from outside the solar system. We were hoping to get uh, molten uh, droplets from the surface of the object Uh when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball that it generated. And indeed, we recovered altogether 850 of them. And they're was, spheres? Are they, just to, for clarification, are they tiny spheres? They're tiny, tiny, tiny. They're tiny spheres, right? They're very small yeah, metallic spheres. Uh, less, less than a millimeter in size, uh, mm-hmm. okay. uh, the size of a grain of sand. So the composition of these things, it's, it's such that it could be it could be some naturally occurring thing we've never seen too, right? right? I mean, it and could just fact, be some sort of yeah. freakish space rock that we that's from so far away. It's a part of a, I don't know what, it's a part of another planet? It came off another planet yes, or something? exactly. Is that exactly. what it could be? Wow, yeah, I guessed so it. In wow. fact, in fa- yeah, you guessed it exactly <laughs> wow. right. Because we actually wrote a paper um, that was accepted for publication in a, a journal called Astronomy and Astrophysics, very prestigious one, Yeah. that, you know, it was accepted for publication last month. And the suggestion was that indeed, the, if you take a planet like the Earth and bring it very close to the most common star, common, you know, uh, the most common type of stars are dwarf stars. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are stars that are about a tenth of the mass of the sun. And there's a tenth of the size of the sun. So actually they're much denser than the sun because the Uh volume goes like the size cubed. And so they're a hundred times denser than the sun. And if you bring a rocky planet like the earth close to any 
common star, dwarf star, uh -huh. it will rip it apart by gravity. It will spaghettify it, uh -huh. create a stream of rocks. A spaghettification, that's a great word. <laughs> yes. So it'll just sort of stream outwards. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and the rocks, uh, I mean, and the, the rocks on the surface of the planet prior to that will be molten, uh, melted. And that's how you get the very unusual composition that we found. Mm. And then they will be ejected to interstellar space at the speed that the uh, IM-1, this interstellar meteor, was found. Mm. So that was kind of a eureka moment for me when we cal I calculated the speed based on the physics of the disruption of a star of a planet like the Earth by a star uh, that is 10% uh, of the mass of the Sun. And I found that this speed of 60 kilometers per second is the, the most natural speed that you will get out of that process. And so then we wrote the paper. It was... Um, it, it, it offers a natural origin for for mm -hmm. this rock, but mm -hmm. but until we find a big piece, we will not know. But your your argument is not that the, you know because sometimes you're you know you're kind of a rebel in the field, and some I see sort of cartoon versions of your arguments out in the popular media, and yeah. you're you're not arguing this is automatically no. you know alien tech. You're saying that's just one possibility. No, I yeah. mean I. I <clears throat> by the way, we had even a press release about this paper that I just mentioned. There was no report about it. Mm. It's amazing. So then you ask yourself, why? You ask yourself, <laughs> yeah. why? Why is the media? I, I think the media is just after clickbaits. Yeah. And very often I say one thing and then they distort what yeah. I say. Of course. So if you want to really, if you want to know what I really think, you should listen yes. to podcasts like this one. Sure. Because there you see it firsthand. Or read your books. Uh, and it's yeah. really unfortunate yeah. because what happens, there is this uh, cycle, I should say. Um, you know, by now, uh, a lot of uh, newspapers and magazines made uh, uh, did a profile about me. You know, just over the past year, there were about a dozen of them. And um, very often they distort what I say. And But but people say that I'm the most uh, well-known right now uh, scientist uh, somehow because of all of this. Uh, the problem is that it's a vicious cycle because the reporters distort what I say and then scientists get upset yeah. Uh, by the fact that what they say doesn't make sense to the scientist, and then they right. blame it on me, and I didn't, right. I never said that. <laughs> and right. So, uh, but uh, listen, yeah, I have I have enormous sympathy for this doctor because I get interviewed and I get misquoted Media. all the time. Yeah, all the time, I get people. They never, they, they will distort. I be like, you have yeah. my, you have my but, sympathy uh, entirely. Paul, uh, the one thing that gives me. Um, strength is the, the the response from artists mm -hmm. because uh, there was a, a, a playwright from Los Angeles called the Josh Rovetch and he sent me an email exactly a year ago. Uh, it was just before uh, April 1st and the email, the title of the email was uh, Avi Loeb on Broadway and uh, <laughs> I thought it's just uh, an April's Fool's job. You know, like, right. um, and uh, I almost didn't respond, but then he attached some uh, photos from his cell phone with Barbara Streisand and others. So then it convinced me. Th but at the end, by now, he wrote a play about my research. And so we are now in contact with a theater, potentially awesome. to present it. Great. And there, there is a, scu a, a sculptor from uh, Spain who made the, uh, he's making actually a huge uh, sculpture about uh, inspired by the research. There was uh, a poet actually just uh, visiting me at home uh, a, a couple of weeks ago uh, and said that he's following my work and it inspires him. And uh, so, you know, this is I interesting, get, though. This uh, is very interesting to me because I, it's something I'm going to take the conversation a little bit off of because I, I think you're right. I mean, I'm an artist and my response to your work is very enthusiastic, realizing still that, you know, there are parameters that you're talking about. If there's something, in your book is, the extraterrestrial is really wonderful because I was surprised how much I felt like it was a kind of work of philosophy, almost as much as it was a work of science. And I thought, yeah, what's so I interesting agree. about this too, I'm curious to ask you about, in science in general, in your life in general though, the function of imagination in, in what you're doing. Because we talk a lot about imagination on this show, and I was, I feel like you're doing something, you're functioning out of imagination, applied scientifically, whatever that means, and you'd need to explain. Yeah, not fantasy, but just imagination, yeah. Yeah, you'd need to explain how you think of it, because that's one of the reasons I was interested that you didn't like science fiction, but you're clearly <laughs> applying 
your faculty of imagination in an interesting way. Right. How you apply it and what it means functioning in science. In science. How much room there is for it, what it means. And because it feels to me like, well, anyway, just, just address that, like the function of imagination. Yeah, that, I mean, Albert Einstein already said that uh, imagination is more important than knowledge mm. in uh, pursuing science. And, you know, for me, uh, you know, that's my territory, imagination, because you're often confronted with um, reality, with facts. Uh, and only if you imagine what it may mean, you know, you can then go ahead and test it properly. You know, we know that most of the matter in the universe, 83% of the matter in the universe is of a substance that we never uh, experienced in the solar system so far. We we, we never... Uh, it's just dark matter? It's called dark matter, yeah. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, there is, I mean, this is just matter, but then there is also dark energy that we don't know much about. But the point is most of the stuff in the universe is of an unknown nature. And of course, you have to imagine what it might be mm. in order to search for it, <laughs> okay? And if you don't, you will not. You will be in the dark. Yeah. And um, therefore, it's really important uh, in order to guide the way you find the answer as to what you could imagine. For me, it comes really easy because... I just hear about something and I immediately, you know, uh, there are ideas that bubble up, bubble up in my head and mm -hmm. I cannot suppress it. You know, the minute I'll stop having ideas, I, I told my students, you should just shoot me. I mean, because there is no <laughs> point. <laughs> I mean, uh, I really, this is really the, the the pleasure I get from from life. You know, when I started my career, uh, my early mentor, uh, John Bacall at Princeton, when I, I was offered the a five-year fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study. And he said, what computer languages do you master? And I said, you know, I just know the minimum that I need in order to solve some uh, equations. I, mm -hmm. I, And he said, how is that possible? That was uh, 1986 when he said that. Mm. And I managed to have a career by now of um, almost 40 years just because I have ideas that... For some, I mean, to me, they sound very natural, but for some reason, others do not think about them. If everyone would think about them, first of all, I would not get probably tenure at Harvard if, if, if it was like common territory. And mm -hmm. secondly, <laughs> if everyone would think about it, I would not be controversial, right? The reason I, I, I you know, people find me different is just because common sense apparently is not common. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wrote a book on um, the uh, called The Evolution of Imagination for University of Chicago Press, and I looked at scientists a lot, and I feel like you fit a very unique, like you said, very unique profile. But when you look at science, which is called sometimes the hypothetical deductive model, you oftentimes you can see the logic of drawing inferences um, at, in order to test your experiments. But nobody really is very clear on what how you form a hypothesis. And here's where I think the imagination plays a really important role, hmm. is hypothesis formation. They even said, okay, it's not induction, it's not deduction. They said, well, let's call it abduction. It is a kind <laughs> of a, a moment of the imagination, and I think you're really good at it, Yeah. Um, but it's rare, and I think it's not taught in school. In fact, I think the imagination in science education is oftentimes demoted, like, oh, that's just going to distract us, you know? Well, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll tell you the way I think of it. I think, um, you know, we are born with it as kids. And uh, unfortunately, society suppresses that because when you become an adult, you know, mm. uh, very often you're motivated not to make a fool of yourself, so you suppress. <laughs> not us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yes, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the biggest um, traumatic experience I had as a kid was uh, sitting at the dinner table and asking a difficult question. And the adults in the room would dismiss the question because mm -hmm. they didn't know the answer. And uh, you know, and then I said, okay, the hell with it. I will try to find the answer myself. So I actually met with the students from my uh, elementary school just um, about five months ago. Uh, and, um, you know, these young kids were sitting around and I said, look, I'm just like you. I'm just a curious 
farm boy. You know, I was born on a farm and I'm curious, just like you, and I'm trying to figure things out. And I, and and they and one of them raised his hand and said, how can you say that, Professor Loeb? Uh, we all know that you are 62 years old. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not a matter of biological age. And, <laughs> you know, I was department chair of the astronomy department at Harvard for nine years. And at the same time, I was also director of the Institute for Theory and Computation and the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative. And I was told, you can't do two jobs. I did three of them at the same time. And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't lose my hair. And the previous <laughs> department chairs <laughs> lose their hair. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and you ask yourself, you, you ask, how is that possible? Well, first of all, I delegate authority on matters that I don't uh, care too much about. I mean, I let others resolve them. Smart. If they, they, yeah, that's smart. Uh, <laughs> that's a skill. <laughs> but second, but secondly, you know, I, I maintain, I, I, I don't pretend. I'm straightforward. I, I don't play politics. You know, the, the, my wife, I told her when we got married, I said, you don't need to worry about me having an affair. <laughs> Because it's too complicated, you know, for me to remember, you know, what, the story that I told you yesterday, and to make it consistent the following day. Right. And uh, no. you know, you know this joke about uh, a physicist that comes back home at midnight. Uh, that pretty much, you know, describes me. Uh, comes back home and says, uh, you know, I worked in the laboratory until now. Well, I actually finished working a few hours ago, but I went to a bar and there was this pretty woman and, and and one thing led to another and he had the uh, uh, lipstick on his on the, on his face and she looked at him and said you liar you stayed in the laboratory all night right um, <laughs> that's good yes yeah no you faked the lipstick yeah no, totally totally it's just interesting i mean there's something there's something in the idea too of being willing to sometimes stake out a radical position just not just for the hell of it but to put something a little a marker a little further out to just open up territory to think in right in, in some well, sense right so, le, that's a great point um let me explain so let me elaborate on that because uh, just a, a couple of months ago i was invited to a uh, Trun poland that's the birth town of nicolaus copernicus mm -hmm. uh, the polish government celebrated 550 years to his birth and Nicholas Copernicus was a priest and he didn't want to rock the boat, okay? Mm. So, but the church just couldn't figure out when Easter takes place. You know, they <laughs> used the model where the earth was at the center of the solar system. And he said, well, let me look into that and realize that if you put the sun yeah. at the center, you can predict when Easter is much better. Oh, amazing. So he gave the model to the church and they said, thank you so much, but we will <laughs> still maintain the view that in reality, you know, the earth is at the center. And indeed, your model helps us a lot. So thank you. And he was worried <laughs> about uh, making it public. And he was given a published version of his book only on his deathbed. And the church actually banned it. It was a forbidden book until the 19th century. But it shows you the integrity of uh, Copernicus. And I gave the lecture on the subject, the next Copernican revolution, mm -hmm. uh, which is for us to realize that we are not at the intellectual center of the universe. Uh, but I do think that, um, you know, even uh, though Copernicus didn't want to rock the boat, that when the boat heads in the wrong direction, you, you it's should rock better, it. It's, you, <laughs> you should have rock to it. rock it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm rocking yeah. the boat just because it's heading in the wrong direction. I mean, the, the, by that, I mean, we are not, searching for space trash you know that yeah right we are sending a lot of trash to space and others may have done that for billions of years let's just check you know that it's not so complicated that sounds to me like common sense yeah i i liked uh one of the things that goes through a lot of your work is obviously you're dedicated to an empirical approach which is let's do an experiment let's check we have the certain the techniques right and yet there's a tendency in the sciences to be, I mean, I'm not going to pick on these guys, but let's take the multiverse theory, which is very hard to test. It may not even be falsifiable exactly. in the sense exactly. of like Karl Popper's idea yeah. that you have to have conjecture and refutation. So why are we dumping all these resources into what is highly speculative that can't be tested, yeah. but we're ignoring your insights? Yeah. 
something that seems just as fantastical as looking for extraterrestrial. I mean, it's no more or less. Well, it's more. It's more fantastic. Yeah. It's more it's fantastic. More fantastical. Fantastical. Yeah. It's yeah. more fantastical. Because, yeah. I mean, uh, I can give you an example. I had the lunch. Uh, sorry, breakfast with uh, a string theorist. <laughs> and I asked him. Um, Not a lot of people your... can say that, doctor. By the way, not everybody can just say I had breakfast with a string theorist. That's great. But, yeah, but he. So I asked him, "What's your most uh, important contribution?" You know, he is one of the distinguished uh, theoretical physicists, and uh, he said the the most the paper I'm most proud of is about supersymmetry. Mm. And I said, "Well, but the Large Hadron Collider at CERN." Uh, you know, demonstrated that at least in the natural parameter space, supersymmetry is ruled out. What does supersymmetry mean? What does it mean exactly, supersymmetry? It's just a a higher symmetry of nature. Mm -hmm. You know, we have um, particles and there are two types of particles. There are particles that if you put them together, they sort of do not like to be in the same state. So they, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just like no, people who are not social, they want to have <laughs> their own space, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, those are called fermions after Nirkofermi, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And uh, the other type of particles actually love to be in the same state. Like, for example, photons that make light. That's what, what a laser is. A laser is a lot of photons in exactly the same state. <laughs> um, it's a coherent state. So these are called bosons after another physicist, Bose. Uh, and uh, at any event, uh, this symmetry, I mean, we have some particles that we know are bosons, some particles that are fermions, but uh, this symmetry is a, a higher level symmetry of nature that says that for every fermion, there is a partner, which is a boson. Uh-huh. And for every boson, there is another. So it, okay. it, it basically... Uh, somewhere, I see. Somewhere there's a world where they work, where they all interact together in some way that yeah, is... But, yeah, but uh, so the, the, in this uh, accelerator, the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, particles were smashed mm-hmm. uh, and they were supposed to uh, generate uh, new particles that reflect the natural parameter space of mm-hmm. space, but they haven't seen them. So then it was ruled out. Mm-hmm. So I said, uh, why would you be so proud of what you've done on a theory that was ruled out? I mean, I'm going here another level. Not not only that string theory is not testable, you know, in the near future, was never tested, but here we are talking about an aspect of uh, that is being entertained by some physicists that was tested and proven to be wrong, at least in that natural parameter space. So he said, well, we just have to wait. Okay, the, <laughs> when we increase the energy of the particles that we smash together, maybe it will show up. And I was reminded by, I, I was reminded by the Lubavitchers, that's a uh, Jewish uh-huh. Orthodox community in Brooklyn. Yeah. And they had a theory, yeah. just like supersymmetry. They said that their rabbi, when he dies, will become the Messiah. Yeah. That was the theory. Oh, okay. really? So that's that's the model, okay? Yeah. And then there was <laughs> a, an experimental data point. The rabbi died, <laughs> but never came back as the Messiah, okay? Yeah. Uh, since then, you know. Oh, we have to keep waiting. <laughs> Just wait. You ask them, you, exactly, you ask them, <laughs> Just what? Is yeah. your theory proven wrong? And they yes. would say, no, we just have to wait. Yeah. Okay. Just wait. So I asked you, I asked you, what's the difference yeah. between some of these theories who are not really surrendering to the verdict provided by experiments, are not even testing their ideas. They don't feel the need to test their ideas. Mm-hmm. And and uh, religious beliefs. Uh, mm. And, um, you know, what I'm trying to do is different. I am actually trying to collect evidence that will guide us because nature is more imaginative. And the biggest question that we can ask that will change the future of humanity is, are we alone? Do we mm. have a partner out there? Is there a neighbor that we can learn from? And to me, it sounds really like negligence for the academic community to ignore this question and put it on the sidelines mm. when at the same time, there are ideas for 50 years that are contemplated and discussed by hundreds of scientists in the mainstream that are not testable. They're yeah, not tested. Yeah. And many of the popular ideas like the multiverse you know, uh, are completely speculative because we can't really visit those regions of space and time that are beyond our own universe. Yeah. And they are popular for some reason. So I, you know, I just think that uh, something is wrong, that, uh, you know, I'm trying to correct it. Yeah. It's not easy because I have critics that scrutinize any detail that I mention about the interstellar meteor, but they never say anything about the multiverse. They never say anything about <laughs> yeah. supersymmetry. Yeah. And, and those are ideas that are in the mainstream and celebrated and awards are given uh, for people who worked on them. But 
yeah, so it's really a very strange situation. You know? I was very surprised. I, I, I think at some some level, I maybe it was because of movies, you know, that that I thought that there wasn't so much scorn for the search, like SETI mm. and the search for for extraterrestrial life. Because I think I'm hung up on movies like Contact and Arrival, and like, oh, the people are doing this all the time, and everybody loves it. <laughs> and so I was surprised to learn. Yeah, I should mention that I I work not right now that uh, yeah. through the Netflix documentary with the yeah. producer of uh, Arrival. Uh -huh. That was uh, actually my favorite uh, science fiction movie. Yeah, that's not. Oh, a, we interviewed yeah. him, the the yeah. writer. We interviewed Ted Chiang for we, our, we for interviewed our show. The man who wrote very the story. smart story. Yeah. Oh no! So I'm talking about the, about the, the the producer yeah. of that. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 So that was a beautiful, uh, and I particularly liked the uh, one aspect of it where there was a need for communication, yes. and it was uh, best uh, done by a woman because yeah. we all know that. Uh, Communication skills of women are because men are terrible at it. Yeah. No, but it's true. The way it came down to language and stuff was really interesting. But I was surprised. I th I didn't realize that it was so marginal. I didn't realize it was so outside, so outside the pale of it. And because it doesn't even seem. I mean, as you say, they built that whole collider just for this stuff, yeah. and it seems way more expensive than just yeah. like looking for some signal coming from outer space. I mean, I don't understand. It's exactly. Yeah. yeah. Looking yeah. for space trash. Yeah. Yeah. This, I, I, you know, this is really a situation where the public has a question that they care most about. This is the question that could change the future of humanity and could inspire us to explore space. Mm. And yet we keep avoiding it when we have the tools to address it scientifically. Only over the past decade, we started detecting objects. Now, for 70 years, there was uh, a search for radio signals, but this is just like waiting for a phone call at home. Nobody yeah. may call you when you are listening. <laughs> uh, if you search your backyard, if you check your mailbox, you might find a package that was sent a long time ago and it's still around, you know, because, uh, I mean, all these... Uh, Objects that we send to space that are moving 10 times slower than needed to escape from the Milky Way galaxy. So you can imagine them accumulating over billions of years in interstellar space, just like plastics in the ocean. Mm. And all we need to do is look around and find them. The Tesla Roadster is not right. visible with our telescopes, you know. Interesting. And the only way for it to be visible is if in 20 million years it will collide with Earth and appear as a meteor. I, I think there's a, a really good point here too that you're making about the the fact that the public really is interested yeah. in this. It's a, it's a vital like uh, motivated um, cause, and the sort of gatekeepers of a very orthodox science are saying like, we're not going to look at this. This isn't serious stuff. Yeah, and I think there's something. But it's a self fulfilling prophecy. That's what I'm trying to say. That yes, yeah. if you don't yeah. search for the evidence, you will not find it. It's yeah. a way of maintaining your ignorance. And the U.S. Go the U.S. government is also interested. I going to say the government the government is doing the same thing though i mean it's obfuscating this stuff that i don't know what the heck to believe when it comes out of there like what they actually have or what they don't have but in any event they're just making it such a confusing issue and i think people would be interested yeah. to know so let me explain my take on it uh, yes, after please. a while of watching it uh first you know government very often has people that pretend to be the adults in the room. Okay, so they will dismiss it yes. uh, and, and say it's nothing. But then at the same time, there would be people who will try to inject a little bit of uh, uncertainty just because they're developing uh, weapons that are yeah. uh, made of advanced technologies that we are not aware of. And yeah. if someone hap happened, someone in the public happened to see evidence for those, they want to create some fuzziness that yes, allows that person to argue that <laughs> yeah. maybe direct. So <laughs> I can understand that well, the government would like to inject some of these yes. uh, narratives yeah, to maintain a, a level of noise. That uh, now I my approach is very different. Again, I'm I'm the kid. Okay, I I, I don't subscribe to the the club of the adults in the room, and uh, <laughs> uh, and and my my point is I don't need you to t I don't need the the government has obviously national security as their day job. Yeah, my day job is very different. My day job is to figure out what lies outside the solar system. That's my day job. And I don't need them to tell me what lies outside because they don't have the best qualified scientists in the world. They don't collect data for the sake of 
learning about the universe. They want to know what uh, China and Russia and other uh, adversarial countries are doing. And that's a, you know, I completely respect that. And I, I, I you know, I support them ha- being funded for, uh, for doing that out of our taxpayers' uh, mm-hmm. money. But uh, at the same time, I, I'm not waiting for them to tell me because the sky is not classified. The oceans are not classified. We can right. search it. It's just that we need to pay attention to it. So, you know, there is this I- I interplay. On the one hand, you have a community of people who looked for radio signals and they want to maintain the the same approach forever. They will keep mm. searching for, and they don't want to discuss, even in their conferences, uh, the possibility that there might be objects, space trash near Earth that should be looked into. And then you have the government on the one hand worrying about uh, balloons that are spying on the US and shooting them down when they figure it out. Uh, and at the same time, they want to introduce some uncertainty in the public's view on on what technologies are flying in the mm-hmm. sky and 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 finally you have the scientific community that because of many years of unsubstantiated claims about ufos uh, uh, and also because of um, you know the public's interest they shy away from the public they say well you, you know it's really viral this subject we don't want you know we want our peace and quiet so let's work on extra dimensions mm. and let's do intellectual gymnastics multiverse is much more yeah a multiverse is way more soothing <laughs> yeah. the way to think of this is uh you define a sandbox uh where you can play and do intellectual gymnastics and demonstrate that you are smart. I mean, yeah. you grew up right. near Yale, uh, Paul, yes. and you know that. Yes, I did. Uh, and, you know, Master of Academia is about impressing peers, trying to show yeah, off that's that right. you are smart. That's interesting. And, yeah. um, you know, I completely uh, reject that. I think, uh, you know, if you're a physicist, you should be committed to figuring out nature. I don't care, you know, about uh, awards, honors. I, what I really care about is figuring out whether we have a neighbor and why don't we just find out? You know, like if the public cares about it, there should be a lot of funding for that. You know, very often the, the funding agencies say, okay, let's appoint committees that will allocate funds. And the committees say, we don't want to waste taxpayers' money on risky projects. So they don't allocate any to that. Yeah. And then I say to them, okay, you don't want to waste taxpayers' money, but did you ever ask the taxpayers what they're interested in? Yeah. They're not interested in finding out what the dark matter is. They want to know if we have a neighbor. So if if they were listening to the taxpayers, you know, my, I, I wouldn't be a, the, a lone voice. They'd fund you. They'd fund your research. They would they, fund you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I'm just so, I don't know how people would react to first, I really wonder how people would react. To first react. contact? Yeah. There's a part of me that wonders if people at this point- We would just start killing seems, each other. Yeah, I don't know. Everybody <laughs> seems so, my concern is that everybody seems so fucking jaded right now that people are like, yeah. oh, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Just, yeah, we got to get back to my TikTok thing. I mean, I don't mean to be like, I mean, I don't, it's wonderful, but I just, I'm like, I wonder. No, but it's a good point. We're very jaded. If people would even notice- yeah. You know, I would hope that people would even care. I, you know what I mean? It's like, I know I would. I know you would. I know people who listen to us would. But it's like, well, I don't know. Why is that? Is that because, like, we're more distracted than ever? Because that's one way it might be. Yeah. Um, maybe. You know? Maybe. Maybe it used distracted. To be like, you know, we, we're not... People used to be much more religious, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Yeah. And I wonder, like the idea of contacting alien life would have come in conflict with your religious views, maybe, mm-hmm. or, or like, yeah, I wonder that says, being a, yeah. maybe it would confirm yeah, these are the saints or the angels or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Or, or, or give you a reason to believe again in some weird way. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like, but I don't know about now. I don't know. I mean, I feel like too, it's like, we've seen it happen in so many movies. It would just be kind of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's, you know I, mean? that's relevant, I wonder yeah. that there's not a boredom or something, but there's yeah. a jadedness about weirdness too. I'm like, yeah. well, this isn't as weird as the thing that I could make on AI. <laughs> I mean, they would have to be kind of extraordinarily interesting yeah. alien people. They can't look like us, and they can't be like us. They can't be, if they're humanoid, like a Star Trek alien. They need to be shimmering blobs. Yeah, they shimmering need to blobs. be shimmer, shimmering blobs. They need to be weird tentacled brains that are like, <laughs> they need to be something really bizarre. Or they need to be really, really hot. 
They need to be <laughs> really, really hot. hot looking. <laughs> Super hot. <like. laughs> yeah, or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're, you know, you have to remember you're weird. Mm. And so am I. Mm-hmm. And you and I have a very high threshold for weird. But like I was talking to someone the other day and they were just like, oh my God, you're, you know, your, your podcast is so weird. And I was like, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It really is like, huh. I guess my I threshold like, oh, is guess. just like, wow. Yeah, my tolerance for weird is really like, uh-oh. <laughs> No, no. Oh, God. Well, this was, that was great. That was really awesome. And my thanks. Yeah, he was fantastic. Wag on. Chinwag is a production of Tree Fort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Tree Fort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardot. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Treefort. Audio production supervision by Jared Brom and Matt Dyson. Editing and mixing by Jared Brom. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Research assistance by Aiden Brooks. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm. And find us on Instagram or TikTok at ChinwagPod or on Twitter at Chinwag underscore pod.